Lawmakers and gun exporters react to the Biden administration's pause on licensing. Plus, Bearing Arms editor and former NRA News host Cam Edwards on the latest in the gun group's corruption trial. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. No, the devil's got no hold on me. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm the founder of The Reload and CNN contributor. You can head over to thereload.com right now and sign up for our free newsletter if you want to keep up to date with what's going on with guns in America. Uh, and of course, if you want to take a deeper dive, you can always buy a membership to The Reload where you'll get exclusive access to hundreds of pieces of news and analysis that you will not find anywhere else. Uh, and you'll also get this podcast today early as well as an opportunity to appear on the show. Uh, with us this week is uh, one of the better minds in the, the gun rights world, one of the best writers out there uh, who runs a little site called Bearing Arms. Uh, Cam Edwards is joining us and he also happens to be a former uh, Ackerman McQueen employee. Uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the NRA trial and what's going on with the nation's largest gun rights organization. And so Cam is Cam is with us to give us some of his personal insight into that whole situation uh, and and maybe a forecast for where things might be headed. Well, welcome to the show, Cam. Hey, Steven. It's always good seeing you, man. Thanks so much for the yeah. invite. Absolutely. It's, it's good to have you back. Um, Love having you on. I think you're one of the other people in the world who follows gun news as closely as I do. So uh, it's it's always great to have you here. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're and you happen to be somebody with maybe a little bit of a you can give us some insider background on this whole NRA situation, uh, because for years you you did a show called uh, NRA. Well, you did NRA News and then uh, Cam and Company. Uh, on NRA TV, I was on your shows a lot at the time, but yep. you have a little bit of uh, uh, experience with with this whole uh, situation that blew up five years ago now, I guess it's been. But um, yeah, so uh, the, the trial has started. It's it's I think Wayne LaPierre, we're filming on Friday. He's testifying right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's not looking great for the NRA, I, I don't think. So, you know, so it's interesting. I mean, when you say it's not looking great for the NRA, what are we exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about the leadership. members? Are we talking about yeah. the leadership, right? Mm. Um, are we talking about the current leadership or the, you know, former leadership that got ditched right before the trial mm. started? Mm. It's interesting because I think even, and I'm, I haven't been in New York, so I haven't been, you know, in the uh, uh, courtroom to hear all of this testimony, but just reading some of the analysis, it sounds like the NRA's attorneys are at times, you know, pointing the finger at Wayne LaPierre and then at other times trying to defend Wayne LaPierre, right? So there's a real tightrope that's being walked here because, you know, the allegations are obviously that there was, you know, a great amount of misspending, uh, corruption at the highest levels of the organization. Letitia James wanted to dissolve the NRA, but the uh, judge in this case said, no, that's not fair because it's the members who've been harmed if they were harmed. And why would, why would we punish them additionally by, you know, taking away their organization? So it has been it's been fascinating to watch, uh, you know, from a distance. I really do wish that I'd been in the courtroom for some of this. And it's it is really interesting to see, you know, folks who I didn't necessarily work with on a day to day basis. You know, as you and I were talking before the show, uh, before we started recording here, I was at a level that was probably one or two levels below where all of the executives were, right? So I wasn't hanging out and smoking cigars with Tony Macris and Tyler Schropp. Um, but I, right. you know, I, I saw Tony Macris and Tyler Schropp on a fairly regular basis. Probably count on, well, two hands. I wouldn't have to use my toes uh, for the, you know, 16 years that I worked at uh, NRA News. Number of times that I had a conversation with Wayne LaPierre and it was generally him saying, oh, you know, keep up the good work and then moving on. Um, What's interesting to me is like how much I, I, I've learned I didn't know, right? So mm. Chris Cox's testimony, for example, where he talks about uh, where he didn't really have a lot of confidence in Andrew Rulanundum. Uh Andrew Rulanundum was sort of Wayne's guy and that uh, he would he wanted to get rid of Andrew Rulanundum. Like I had no idea that that was the dynamic uh, at play. I thought, you know, Andrew was Chris's right-hand man. I didn't know that uh, it wasn't necessarily Chris's choice to have Andrew there uh, by his side. So, yeah. It is it is interesting to just kind of realize how much stuff was being kept, not only from members, but how much stuff was really kind of hush hush 
within the building um, and even within, you know, the the Ackerman circle, uh, you, you, there really was, I think, the level of those folks in the know um, and those folks who were, you know, the decision makers and then, you know, everybody else who were just sort of the, like I said, the worker bees, you know, whose daily job was to make sure that the organization was as strong as possible, make sure the Second Amendment was as strong as possible. And, you know, that's been one of the most frustrating things for me, Stephen, is that I know there are so many good employees of the NRA. There are people who are really dedicated to the Second Amendment. They care about the organization. They care about its members. And to see and to hear just, you know, all of the 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 milking of these members and their money, um, it, it's it's frustrating and infuriating to to know and to realize just how how widespread and and, and to the degree that this was apparently taking place. Yeah, you know that's it's interesting because uh, you mentioned there Chris Cox, who's the former head of the Institute for Legislative Act, Act uh, what is legislative action. Apparently, a bit of a tongue twister. For <laughs> um, it's basically the head lobbyist, the NRA. Andrew Rulanundam, who was the spokesperson for ILA, Institute for Legislative Action, uh, who then became later on just the spokesperson for the communications director overall for the NRA. Um, and, and obviously, Wayne LaPierre was the CEO and executive vice president. Um, you know, and one of the tensions seems to be, and, and something that I noticed even before everything broke out into the open, was uh, between isla and ackerman because andrew initially came from ackerman and uh you know mm -hmm. under chris i think there was a lot no, of, i don't think andrew ever worked for for ackerman i believe he, I, I believe he did long time ago um andrew's okay much that would older predate 2004 because i wasn't I, I that's when i you know got hired on and came a company started and hmm. at that point he had been over at isla for a while so i'm not sure yeah. when that would have been hmm. well uh I, I believe there's a report that he was from Ackerman, but a long, a long, long time ago. Uh, but either way, there there always seemed to be a tension between Ackerman and and Isla. Did you ever notice that? Uh, working? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Um, and you know, I, I think that they try to have a good working relationship. But uh, yeah, I think Ackerman was always seen as Wayne's thing. Right. Mm. And it wasn't necessarily Chris Cox's thing and it wasn't Isla's thing. Um, yeah. And I think that the tension was, you know, Isla is the political arm of the NRA. Um, and, you know, Ackerman is coming up with campaigns that in some ways would have, I think, tread on what Isla's responsibility was. Um, yeah. And so I, you know, again, all of these discussions and you know arguments are happening outside of my earshot but i think it was yeah i think it was fair to say that there was that that tension uh that uh, you know isla and chris cox probably would have preferred not having to work or deal with ackerman mcqueen hmm. yeah i mean there was there was a lot of crossover between the two organizations tyler Schropp, who you mentioned earlier wasn't was an ackerman guy yep uh, before he went to the nra and ackerman gave him a a uh, American Express card, I believe, or a credit card from them to use while he was at the NRA. There's a whole audio recording that we, we talked about uh, a little while back where they lay out kind of how this scheme worked uh, and is sort of the center of a lot of this controversy, right, is that you'd have NRA hide its more embarrassing expenses like these luxury uh, trips or private jet flights or five-star hotels, suits you know all that stuff that's been out there the instead of having that on their books they'd put it on ackerman's books and then ackerman would just bill back without saying what the bill was for yeah uh, that's kind of the center of how this whole uh, scandal worked uh, in practice and you know one of the things that strikes me uh from i remember you know when when this whole thing blew up and ackerman's laid off everybody at nra tv Right. One of the things that always was remarkable to me was like it didn't seem like a lot of that uh, the big money trickled down to the actual shows. Right. Like it, your staff was not making a lot of money, even though Akron was charging forty million dollars a year for the services it was it was providing to the NRA. Is that I mean, is that an accurate understanding of how how that worked? 
You know, I, I mean, I think so. I, I Listen, you know, I didn't have a seven figure salary, uh, even after, you know, 16 years of, of being at NRA News. I, I there was I'm not making near as that much money. Um, but I think we I think, you know, as far as the salaries for like my producer, um, and you know, the editors that were involved, Hey, we had, we did have a pretty lean machine, right? So at one yeah. point, Cam and company is on Sirius XM three hours a day. And then we're on sportsman channel doing an hour long TV show. We had besides me, we had a dedicated staff of <sighs> John pop was our executive producer. Cameron gray was our radio producer. Um, Eric price was our sportsman channel producer and that that was pretty much it right like we had you know an editor we had some control room folks but they weren't tasked full time with doing cam and company um and so you basically had you know a producer for each show uh an executive producer sort of overseeing everything and then me right, right. so that's a that's a pretty lean machine when you're doing yeah. a, you know full service radio show and a tv show um yeah. and it, you know it it, it was it was a, the only time I really got frustrated about it. Like we were able to do, you know, the radio show just fine. I was a little frustrated when Sportsman Channel brought us on that, you know, I, I did kind of feel like we were running on, you know, coach strings, basically. Um, and it would have been interesting to see, you know, what would have happened had the money been there, had the budget been there. But I think when NRA TV launched, that was a little bit different story. You know, I, I don't know what these salaries were, but I have been I've been told <laughs> that uh, the folks who were hired as part of NRA TV. Um, now, first of all, they were not Ackerman employees. They were they were contract. Right. They were on mm. contract. I was an actual okay. employee. I got a paycheck every couple of weeks. I had you know benefits and everything else. So when they expanded and brought in other shows, I think that's when they sort of changed that model of, OK, now we're just going to hire people you know on a contract basis. Um, and so you know, maybe that accounts for uh, a little bit of the spending disparity. But I, I, mm. I was I've been told that these salaries for those programs were pretty good uh, for the uh, for the on air talent anyway. Um, yeah. For certain people, I, that's, yeah. that's my understanding as well. But but, you know, it's just uh, I, I think it kind of gets at the heart of the story. Of this this whole situation with the NRA and Ackerman is not that Ackerman didn't provide any useful services to the NRA. In fact, Frankly, most of the things people know about the NRA came from Ackerman. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the whole I Am the NRA ad series, the Charlton Heston stuff, really all the celebrity stuff that was all Ackerman's uh, doing, you know, as part of their strategy. Uh, everything people know about Wayne LaPierre, basically they created his public image. Um, you know, the, the, they ran the annual meetings. They did NRA TV. Uh, you know, you, Dana Lash, Colin Noir didn't work directly for the NRA, he worked for Ackerman. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, the point is not that they didn't, that it was a total scam, right? It, the, the, NRA, the NRA and Ackerman had a very successful working relationship. It's just that on top of that, they were, you know, using charity money, NRA money to fund lavish lifestyles. And, uh, you know, it'd be interesting that's and this, I think, is maybe an example of where if that money had gone instead to improving NRA operations, uh, who knows what more the organization could have accomplished. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. Um, you know, and I'm sure that there are folks who would say, well, the same goes for Ackerman money, right? If they weren't spending you know, however many millions of dollars a year on Ackerman, that could have gone to, you know, the general operations side of things. Sure. Um I, you know, but as you say, and this is when one of the interesting things, and one of the frustrating things I think about this whole case is that it's not that the NRA was a complete grift, right? Or right. is a complete grift. Um, no. that, that's not the issue. I, you know, more than one thing can be true, right? Like, I, I think the whole investigation by Letitia James was a witch hunt. Politically I also motivated. think she uncovered so, some witches, right? I think both of those things can be true. Right. Um, this could be politically motivated, but it also could have uncovered some, you know, real issues within the organization. Similarly, you know, the organization, I think you can make the case, certainly, that, uh, you know, there was money wasted. There was money spent on things that, that shouldn't have been spent on. But that doesn't mean that the organization wasn't doing good things. I think that's, you know, that's why the NRA is worth fighting for. It's why you've got folks like, 
uh, you know, Frank Tate or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Buzz Mills who are, you know, trying to reform the organization because it is an organization that, that, that has done good in the past that is capable of doing good in the future. Um, as long as, you know, the, the issues get fixed and resolved. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, the internet did so much. I mean, and it's so, so it's hard to point to like, well, where, you know, could that money have gone to? I mean, you could say, could have gone to the civil rights defense fund. You could have been funding more lawsuits. It could have gone to, you know, training and education could have gone to the disabled shooting sports uh, program, which I always, I thought that was a great program that never really got a whole lot of attention. Uh, and I don't know how much money it got, but it had a very small staff when, you know, when I was uh, doing NRA news and, you know, that's been one of just personally, Steve, I mean, that's been one of the frustrating things for me. And I don't want to, I, I, I hope this doesn't come off as me too to my own horn because that's not what I'm trying to do, but I'm an NRA benefactor life member, uh, in addition to, you know, working for Ackerman and, and hosting Cam and company. And when, when I was doing Cam and company, like my wife and argue, my wife and I would argue all the time because I get back from the annual meeting or whatever. And she'd say, have you done your expenses yet? And I say, no. Because A, I, I didn't have a lot of expenses, but B, I didn't need the NRA members to cover my dinner. I didn't need for them to pay for my cab ride. You know, I, I, I didn't need that and I didn't want to do that. So there were a lot of times where, you know, we went out on, on trips and I didn't submit my expenses because I just said, it's not worth it. You know, a, a, a $50 dinner, that's two NRA memberships, you know, that's money that, that could be spent somewhere else. And if I had that attitude, and I know, again, a lot of NRA employees have that attitude, um, it it ticks me off that apparently the higher ups didn't have that same attitude. Because like I said, there were a lot of people, a lot of worker bees who were making sacrifices. They weren't getting paid a lot, um, but they were doing everything they could to make sure that the members got the most bang for their buck, no pun intended. And that did not carry over to the top. And that's what's really frustrating to me. Yeah. And, and I, that's been my experience in talking to lower level NRA staff, right? People who mm -hmm. weren't in the C-suite, so to speak, uh, that a lot of them join the NRA and work there. And, and this, not that that doesn't extend to some of the, the executives as well, but, but a lot of uh, the lower level staff take on the job because they believe in the mission of the NRA. Absolutely. Uh, and, and they're willing to take less pay or to forego you know, charging their expenses back to the organization because of exactly what you, you described. The NRA really is funded by its membership. It's not, a, you know, yes, it has big donors as well, but the primary form of funding that it, that it maintains is from dues from members. And those are people who uh, are often not very wealthy, right, that, that, that are putting in money that they uh, – have to make room in their budget to do uh and and that is the big scandal to me in all of this is that those it's the, it, this isn't some billionaire's money that's being diverted towards uh luxury trips or yacht you know, yacht yacht vacations or, or what have you this is average people and and you know i, I think there was remember i remember a, a a board meeting where they were uh, you know, you were, we were focused on all this stuff. I think it was a couple of years ago, and uh, it was perhaps I believe it was when they authorized the bankruptcy uh, or authorized it after the fact because the board was. That's a whole another issue with governance at the NRA, right? It's part of this. But another thing that they did was approve a resolution to sell a house because one of the ways that the NRA gets money is people will leave their stuff to the NRA in their will. And it's not just rich people who do this. Right. This was, I remember this house very specifically. It was a $100,000 home in Boise, uh, Idaho. Right. So this is, that is not a wealthy individual's house. No way, matter way how you slice it, even a couple of years ago at a hundred thousand um, dollars, that that's, that's a regular working person's home. And they yeah. gave that to the NRA in their will because they believe in the organization's mission. And that is what gets at the core of the problem here. Right? This, these are, this is money that you're taking from regular hardworking Americans who believe in what you're trying to do. And you're diverting that so people can live a rock star lifestyle. Yeah. Like when it came out that Woody Phillips 
was was billing the NRA or getting expenses for commuting from Texas to headquarters. Like that was another one of those like gobsmacking moments to me because, you know, so as you know, at the end of 2012, um, we bought a house in, you know, rural Virginia. It was three hours south of D.C., but I was still doing Cam and Company in Alexandria. And so for about 14 months, I rented a 10 by 10 foot bedroom in somebody's townhouse in South Alexandria. I would come home on Friday night. I would drive back Monday morning. Occasionally I'd go home on a Wednesday night if we were, you know, really missing each other. Um, I never, I would, I would never have even thought <laughs> to try to, you know, expense my gas or my rent. Like that was my decision, right? Like my job is here. I don't want to live in Northern Virginia anymore. We want to live over here. So it's my responsibility to make sure that I can still do my job with my family, you know, three hours away. That was not the NRA's responsibility. It was not Ackerman's responsibility. It was my decision and the costs incurred were my costs. So when I heard that about what he feels like, that was, boy, that was the moment where I saw red because I was in an exact same position. And again, I can't, I cannot think of a single NRA employee that I know or that I worked with who would have had that same attitude of, well, you know, I, I don't want to live here anymore, but I'm going to make the organization pay for my expenses to go back and forth. That's such BS. And again, where was that, that telling me that money couldn't have been used for a better purpose, you know, than uh, providing an executive with, you know, the expenses to commute from Texas to Northern Virginia. I mean, that's, a t you're right. That's the stuff that's so infuriating and should be infuriating to the rank and file members. Like, I don't know how closely every NRA member is following this, but it's stuff like that, that, that to me says, okay, listen, there's a problem. It needs to be addressed. It needs to be resolved. And the only way to do that is to have, you know, far more transparency and accountability than what was present and maybe what's present now. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I mean, and I think one way that you can tell how the membership has reacted to all this is just by the fact that so many have left, you know, yeah. they've lost over a million members. They haven't, uh, I believe they've even shrunk from when that report came out because uh, I believe it was 4.3 million when, when I wrote that piece at the time last, last year, or even two years ago. And now the latest numbers that I've heard is 4.2 million. So they've continued to lose membership. Now, uh, Chris, there's a bunch, there's like two and a half million lifetime members. So they'll never get lower than that. Yeah. I mean, I'm one of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So it, you can see, I think perhaps a reaction in the membership just by their, through their actions, you know, speak louder than words in a lot of cases. Right. Uh, and I would say too, you know, it wasn't just Woody Phillips doing that. Right. right? One of the other big uh, controversies in this case surrounds Wayne LaPierre's niece who works for, or worked for the, I'm not sure if she's still there or not. Um, she was last report I saw, but she works for the women's women's leadership forum lives in Nebraska and very commonly was having private flights, uh, not just for her, but for her husband and uh, uh, to come and watch her child during a, an event in Las Vegas was, was one private flight, not like she was already there. And then they flew out her husband to watch their child. Like, uh, and they commonly did stuff like that with, with her, uh, flew her from uh, Dallas to Orlando on a private flight that cost $27,000, I believe, uh, you know, it's, that's the kind of stuff that was, not an abnormal thing, according to at least the the complaints in this in this New York lawsuit. So um, it, it wasn't even limited to just you know the the CFO or or even the CEO. It was also employees that they had a close relationship with or related to would, would get this kind of treatment as well. But presumably not the rest of you. No, I mean it, it, clearly, you know, if you were. If you were in the in crowd, right, if you were in the the uh, the in circle um, and again, you didn't necessarily have to be in the C-suite, right? If, if you had that maybe personal connection or that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that friendship um, with folks who were, you know, at, at that in that golden circle, um, then, yeah, uh, you know, apparently you got to live very, very well. I just, you know, again, I mean, twenty seven thousand dollars for a, a private jet. That's, you know. That that alone would have gone a long way towards funding a piece of litigation, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't have gotten you all the way to the Supreme Court, but 
that would have at least got you the opening brief. It would have probably gotten you through, you know, a, a good part of the uh, preliminary injunction against any particular law. Like that's just money that could be, again, it's just wasted, right? Yeah, it's just for, absolutely for wasted. Like if you- to that point, actually, real quick for reference, um, I remember Tom King, who's the president of the New York Rifle uh, and Pistol Association, uh, was he's actually stood up to defend Wayne uh, at a members meeting, and he used the he, he said the, the NRA had helped fund their lawsuit in Broome, which was the big landmark case, uh, a legitimate accomplishment of an NRA state affiliate. Mm-hmm. He said that they had supported them to the tune of $1 million. So a $1 million got the NRA brewing. Um, so, I mean, just to, to go to what you're saying, there, just to give people some context of how far some of this money could go if put in the right spot. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, like, so so you need somebody to watch your kid. Okay, well, it's your responsibility to make sure that your husband's there to watch the kid. Maybe ask Uncle Wayne, uh, hey, uh, Uncle Wayne, you know, can you spot me the money so I can bring my husband out there? But, uh, you know, again, all kinds of ways to handle this, all kinds of ways that 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 you and I and most everybody listening to your uh, podcast would handle these types of things without depending on a an organization to pick up the funds for all of these personal expenses. You know, it's just, Mm -hmm. again, it's just so aggravating to see the waste that went on. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, we should note, right. That a lot of this is our, a lot of these things are allegations that the NRA disputes that Wayne LaPierre LaPierre disputes. Uh, Although not all of them, I think that's another important thing to understand. Like Wayne LaPierre has repaid the NRA hundreds of thousands of dollars in what they classified as excess benefits, which was a lot of these private flight. Uh, now he's accused of diverting tens of millions of dollars more than that over the years. And then, you know, that's just in the sort of personal expenses that the NRA paid for LaPierre. There's also all kinds of other corruption allegations like the yacht trips that that I mentioned earlier, those were on, uh, that was Wayne took, Yacht trips on, on a boat owned several boats, actually several yachts, apparently um, owned by an NRA contractor. This was another way that that corruption uh, is alleged to have happened at the NRA. So uh, David McKenzie, who is a Hollywood producer and and uh, but also works directly with the NRA. One of his uh, companies works in their uh, me- their membership service, uh, like the provide services to NRA members on a contract basis with the NRA makes has made over a hundred million dollars from that deal in the, uh, over the course of the time they've been doing it. And also Wayne was using his yacht for free, uh, oftentimes, including for trips to, uh, with his, his niece and her family. And so, you know, it's not just these personal expenses. There's also this whole other world of, um, contracts that have obvious conflicts of interest that weren't disclosed. Uh, he didn't, Wayne never disclosed any of these trips that he took, even though they're supposed to disclose any gift over $300. Um, and so that's actually what he's testifying about today. Uh, he also used NRA money apparently to give gifts to the McKenzie's, including an $800 candlestick. I, you know, it's uh, it's there's a long list of, of accusations here. Some of them are disputed. Some of them LaPierre and the NRA have admitted to. Yeah. And, I, you know, listen, I mean, I, I think that. Um, uh, when it comes to the allegations, uh, as I said, uh, you know, I think that Letitia James was uh, engaged in active political activism. I think she's continued to engage in an active political activism. So mm. this is one of the things that's really tough when you're watching this and especially again, not being in the courtroom, but having to rely on, you know, sort of secondhand accounts of what's going on and all of the testimony, which is condensed down, you know, a day's worth of testimony is condensed down to like a hundred thousand words. It's really tough to get a sense of, okay, so what's been proven, uh, what's been disproven, what is still, you know, sort of in a murky gray area. But as you say, you know, one of the NRA's defenses is, yeah, we did things wrong, but we're trying to make it right. And that includes Wayne LaPierre paying this money back. That includes Wayne LaPierre stepping down, although 
we were also told that he was stepping down for health reasons, right? So they, you're right. They've acknowledged, yeah, okay, there were mistakes that were made, right? But we're trying to rectify these mistakes, so we shouldn't be punished anymore because we're trying to do the right thing now. Right. Um, and you know, I guess the, the the question then becomes, is that true? <laughs> you know, and and can you correct these mistakes with the folks who were around, uh, at least to some level, uh, yeah. and should have had some knowledge, right, of, of what was going on. Because um, that's the major issue right now is that even though LaPierre is leaving at the end of the month, most of his st strongest allies are actually the ones still in control of the organization. People who, like Charles Cotton, for instance, who's the NRA president and who they uh, actually amended the bylaws to keep president, um, he was on the audit committee that approved a lot of these arrangements retroactively. Uh, you know, a lot of, and Andrew Willanundum, who we talked about earlier, was moved to be the head of general operations. They fired the previous head, uh, Divergilis, to, to get Willanundum into that role so that he would be the interim executive vice president and CEO when Wayne left. Um, right. Because under the bylaws, the head of general mm -hmm. operations automatically becomes the interim EVP and CEO. Right. And so the question is, you know, the NRA's, uh, like you laid out there, their main argument in court is, yes, some of these things happened, not all of them. That's why you see the sort of uh, back and forth of defending Wayne at points or blaming him for things at points, because they want to say that they've already punished Wayne to a certain degree, or at least gotten back the money that he uh, took that he shouldn't have or spent on things he shouldn't have spent them on, uh, but that they've fixed the organization. This has been their their basic approach the entire time. And the big problem with that is a lot of the people who were in charge when the uh, corruption occurred are still in charge. And so it's, I'm wondering, you know, if you want to look into your crystal ball here, <laughs> Um, where do you think this trial is going to come out? You know, I mean, if I had to hazard a guess, um, I would say that Letitia James has the upper hand, um, maybe not even based on the facts, but based on the location. You mm -hmm. know, I, I think New York City is probably a pretty hostile environment for the NRA uh, to defend itself. Um, so I think that we are going to see, I, I, if my guess is that we are going to see, uh, you know, a verdict that uh, Letitia James can can call successful, right? That the NRA will be ordered to repay, you know, however many more uh, dollars um, that they're there. And I think there's a really good chance that there probably will be a special monitor appointed to yeah. oversee the group's finances. Right. Um, where I am still, I, you know, I, all right. So <laughs> I also don't see the fundamental change within the organization happening that I think needs to happen. If I'm going to be blunt, um, I'd love it. If that was the case, but you know, I think what we've seen is that sort of entrenchment, right? And I've always believed the NRA is bigger than any of its members, whether it's Wayne LaPierre, Chris Cox, Charles Cotton, myself, whoever, right? The organization, its strength comes from its millions of members, and no one person should be more important than the, the, the bulk of the membership. So from my perspective, I think that the current leaders have lost the trust, certainly of myself and a lot of other NRA members, again, or former members who've left the organization. And that if they care about the organization, my belief is that they should step aside. I would actually love to see, you know, one of the things that's it's so problematic to try to reform the organization is I think what it's a third of the board that's up uh, for election yeah. at any given time. Right. So yep. there is no way to make a wholesale change on the board um, because you're going to have to go through multiple elections. You're going to have to go through the nominating committee. I guess the board. Honestly, there's a part of me that would love to board. see every board member fall on their sword and say, you know what, we're resigning. I might run for reelection. Um, but let's have a clean slate and let's let the members decide where we're going to go in the future, because this is a membership based organization. I don't see that happening at all. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what I would prefer to see, but you know, I, I am afraid that what we're going to see is just, again, a continuation of this 
this attitude of, you know, we haven't really done anything wrong. Um, we don't really face any real problems. Uh, everything's great. Just, you know, stick with us, stick with a plan. And everything's going to be fine. And I, I just don't think that that's the case. And I, I think there are a lot of current and former members who would agree with me that if we keep going in this direction, if we keep spending this much money every year on legal bills, um, and we keep seeing the you know donations declining, that this is an organization that is either going to cease to exist or it's going to cease to exist in a meaningful way in the not too distant future. And I think that would be an absolute tragedy. Can the Second Amendment movement survive without the NRA? I think we can. But again, this is an organization that does a lot of good, has done a lot of good, I think can continue to do a lot of good if those repairs are made. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you in terms of uh, where I see this all coming out. Um, I think that Wayne LaPierre and the other individual defendants will be ordered to not work on a nonprofit ever again in New York. That's one of the punishments that they can get. And then they'll be ordered to repay. Interestingly, they'll be ordered to repay the NRA, mm-hmm. not, not New York State or anything like that, because that right. NRA is the one who's been harmed. Um, but I, I would be surprised if you don't get a court appointed overseer. Uh, and that, that would come with, uh, I think for, for reformers, you know, like yourself and, and many others, uh, there's a lot of potential upside and a lot of potential risk with that because, uh, the judge has seemed to be pretty fair thus far. He was the one who said, James can't dissolve the organization. That wouldn't make sense as you mentioned earlier. Uh, but at the same time, he's also said that the allegations are very serious and that they would, uh, you know, that they would need, they would likely result in serious changes being needed if, if they're proved to be true. Um, so he, he seems to be handling things fairly down the middle. Um, you know, certainly the jury I've pulling it from New York is likely to produce a jury. That's not going to be super eager to let the NRA, uh, off the hook, or at least it's, it's membership, it's leader leadership off the hook for the stuff that they've done. Um, I mean, obviously, hopefully you would get a relatively, the system is still designed to give you as impartial a jury as you can, as you could get, but the overseer is going to have the potential perhaps to reform the organization, the way it works to get rid of some of the opaqueness of how the NRA operates of its bylaws that lead to these sorts of, um, possibilities for corruption, right? The, the way the NRA is designed to operate leads, lends a lot of power to a small group of individuals at the top and obfuscates a lot of that through the way the board operates, how big the board is, you know, how, how you get on the board, the, all this stuff that you, you got into a little bit there. Um, so an or, maybe an overseer could come in and change some of those things. Uh, but of course, an overseer maybe they're going to be politically tinged as well. Like, like James is, and uh, they're, they're not going to be in there to try and actually fix the NRA, but to hamper it, that's a real risk that exists. Um, absolutely. With politics. Yeah, getting I, tied I, up in it. Absolutely. And I, so I think, I think, you know, it's going to be important to, um, if, if a monitor is appointed, um, you know, it's going to be critical to, to know what powers that monitor has. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, if it really is just a matter of, okay, well, we're going to, they're going to be pouring over, you know, uh, expenses with a microscope. Um, and you know, they're going to disclose, you know, the, these, uh, uh, payments that might be untoward, or they're going to say, no, that's, you know, you're not spending money here. Um, that's one thing, but if the monitor is then trying to insert themselves into policy fights, Mm-hmm. And say, you know, no, you know what? The organization doesn't have a million dollars to spend on a case like Bruin, um, or that's not a, a a good use of the organization's money at a time in which you know uh, there are all these legal bills and other things. You're right. There's a lot of danger, yeah. um, and so I, you know, I, I've seen some folks who are just they they seem very excited about the prospect uh, of reform coming from a special monitor. I think you're absolutely right to note the double-edged sword uh, nature uh, of that appointment. And I yeah. think it's way too early to presume that that would be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, because again, you if you've got... very close. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, and again, if you're trying to rebuild trust in the organization and you're trying to get those members back, I, I think having a minder is not a good look to begin with. Um, but if that, if that minder is, again, inserting themselves into the politics and the policy fights... 
Yeah, Someone appointed by a federal judge in New York at the behest of the New York Attorney General who declared the NRA to be a terrorist organization. You know, like that's that's going to be really tough for the organization yeah. to to you know uh, regain mm-hmm. the trust of its members, um, and I think it's going to do more damage. So it could. It is something that is going to have to be followed very very closely, and I think it's it's a little too early to tell. I think. Again, we don't know what the verdict's going to be. We don't know if a monitor is going to be appointed. We don't know what powers they would have. But it, those are those are, I think, legit concerns for uh, NRA members, former members, and and folks who want to see the organization, you know, survive and thrive in the future. And I, I also think another thing to watch out for is another bankruptcy attempt by the NRA. Like if they actually are put into a situation where uh, a receiver is ordered by the the judge in New York, that might give them the justification they need to go back to federal bankruptcy court uh, and try to rerun the the plan that they had last time around. Um, and so that's, that's another possibility I could see coming down that maybe people don't uh, expect, but, um, but something again, yeah, like you said, we're two weeks into the trial. The trial should last about six weeks. Uh, we'll, We'll have to see exactly what comes from all of it, but you know, and 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 then we'll have to see what kind of effect that has. Because you, you talked about how it could, uh, this organization could either re- rebuild itself, have a kind of rebirth, or it could continue on its downward spiral and end up being either completely gone or a total shell of itself. And I don't know that it's even that far away from the second option already, um, especially in terms of what it's going to be able to do in this upcoming election. But, but I think these are all things we need to have you back on down the line to, to look closer at um, and and see where things are going. I mean, Trump is speaking at the great American outdoor show on February 9th. So maybe we could have you back on to discuss that once it happens, but um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to stay on top of this for sure. Cause like you mentioned, I mean, I think people also underestimate how important the NRA is to the gun rights movement. Um, it's a, it was at its peak, a $400 million organization that does not just legal work, like a lot of its, the sort of alternatives that have grown a bit, uh, in, during its, its decline, but also does lobbying and political spending that nobody else has risen up to try and match, um, mm-hmm. both at the federal and state levels. Um, it, it does, uh, nationwide gun safety training courses that at a, at a level that nobody else has matched either. Uh, it does uh, competition shooting. It does, you know, uh, youth shooting. It, it does so much more than I think people recognize. And it has so, so much more influence than um, what I think the gun rights movement can muster in the short term, at least, with, without it being around. Um, maybe in the long term, I think something else would come up. Uh, but, but, you know, now... It's, it's things are going to be pretty rough. You know, I, I think that that's right. I mean, and listen, you can make the case that, you know, for the past five years, the NRA has been diminished yeah. to one degree or another. Right. Right. Um, and so that, you know, maybe we saw we've already started gun, living through this gun control law passed in that time. The first the first new gun restrictions <laughs> since, uh, you know, in 30 years. Right. Not that it's the biggest, not not what everybody on the gun control side wanted, but it's it did they can still claim a victory. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you're right. I mean, again, I don't think, look, the second amendment movement doesn't disappear if the NRA disappears. And I don't think the NRA is again, disillusions off the table. So if the NRA disappears, it might be begin because of, you know, a second bankruptcy or, or, you know, something like that, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, but there would be a hole, you know, that would be difficult to fill. It would make our job as second amendment advocates harder um, to not have the NRA around doing the things that it's supposed to do. Right. And so to me, that's, that's, again, that's the, that should be the goal is to get the NRA back to doing the things that it does well, that it, you know, has a big footprint in, um, that have been either, you know, greatly diminished or have simply been put on hold completely, um, as a result of the issues over the last five years. And I think it was Charles Cotton, who said uh, in one of his statements, maybe within the past week or two, you know, the NRA has never been in a stronger position. Um, 
And that to me was just a Baghdad Bob moment. You know, like that was, <laughs> no, I mean, like, I mean, come on, you know, if you, you gotta be straight with the members, you can say it's a challenging environment. You can blame it all on Letitia James, but don't tell me the NRA has never been in a stronger position. Yeah. Um, because if you truly believe that, then you can't fix the problem because you don't see the problem. And that's really what concerns me, you know, is that you've just got leaders who, uh, who, 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 who don't want to acknowledge the problem because they don't want to engage in the types of activities it's going to take to fix the issues. Yep. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, I'm hoping to make a trip up to New York and to Harrisburg to cover the Trump speech and the at least parts of this trial. You know, obviously it's six weeks. We would go bankrupt here at the reload if I tried to stay in New York City for six weeks. But, um, but yeah. I'm hoping to get up there for I six weeks. I think Letitia James was actually trying to get some of the witnesses to stay in New York for six weeks. I, I talked with uh, someone who was on the witness list uh, and they were telling me like that was that was the anticipation was that they would just be there in New York city, you know, to be available at any time. And they're like, that's not going to work. That's not going to fly. Yeah. So I don't know how, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how that was actually resolved, but yeah. Well, um, so, you know, I'm hoping to get up there for some key dates. Obviously Wayne's testifying. Uh, maybe I'd like to go, but honestly, to be fair, a lot of this stuff was covered in the bankruptcy. So I'm not seeing a ton of new information coming out of the trial so far. That was the mm -hmm. thing about the bankruptcy It's kind of like a, like a practice round for the attorney general. And she really got a lot of the stuff she needed. And it sounds like much of what's going on in this case is just her pointing to things that were already said in, in depositions or, or during trial in the bankruptcy. So it's a bit of a rerun situation, but I think there's still going to be important moments that I'm hoping to be able to be up there for, because there's really no other way uh, other than what you mentioned with following, uh, you know, some reports from like courthouse news or, or, uh, you know, trace, I think has someone there. Uh, and so that's not ideal. I'd rather be able to see it directly, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. You just miss so much. Um, yeah. you know, and I, I realized that watching the, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse trial, uh, yeah. because, you know, that was obviously televised watching that for eight hours a day and then reading the summary, you know, again, you just realize how much, gets left out because a reporter can't cover, you know, mm -hmm. they can't write 20,000 words a day on everything that's happening. So yeah. uh, it would be great to have your perspective in the courtroom uh, on those dates. If, if we can, I, I'm also hopefully going to be in Harrisburg uh, when uh, Trump is speaking to the NRA. So if we can get together, uh, maybe, maybe I don't even know if you're going to be doing a podcast like remotely. I don't know if we have that. Yeah, ability, maybe, but uh, maybe we'll we can do something, do something like from that. Harrisburg. All right. Well, let's, let's make a plan to have you back on to go over all this stuff, update on the trial, update on, the NRA's political actions heading into 2024 here. Um, their, their presidential forum with only one of the presidential candidates that's still left. Uh, I think uh, bold prediction here. I think they're probably going to endorse Donald Trump at this, this event. Um, even if Nikki Haley is still in the race at that point. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to see. And, and we'll have you back on for that. Uh, if, if you're available to do it, cause I uh, always appreciate your insight into what's going on. Always, always love the conversation, Stephen. And thank you for everything that you do. You are a fantastic resource for gun owners. Um, and again, folks, if you're not a subscriber to The Reload, sign up for The Reload, join The Reload, because we need Stephen's independent reporting out there. Well, thank you for that pitch. Now, why don't you make a pitch for Bearing Arms, which is also an invaluable resource? I, I will say the uh, same thing. We've got a, a great team of writers, uh, Tom uh, Knighton, John Petrolino, Ryan Petty, uh, kicking in pieces when he can. And yeah, just check out barryandarms.com. Check out Barry and Arms Cam and Company. If you like what you see, you can become a VIP or VIP Gold member. And uh, you'll get, again, exclusive content, just like you get when you uh, join the Reload as well. Yeah. I don't think we step on each other's exclusive content uh, too much. But, no, I think uh, you guys do a little more commentary than and we do a little more of the original reporting. So it's it's a nice compliment, I think. Yeah. yeah. But all right. Well, we'll have to have you on in the future. Thanks again for, for coming on this week. Uh, and, and giving us a lot of your time to go over this and giving us uh, so even some personal insights into your time uh, working at Ackerman. Yeah, always a pleasure. All right. Look forward to doing it again soon, Stephen. Absolutely. And we'll uh, head over to our news update now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the weekly news update. I'm contributing writer Jake Fogelman, joined as always by Reload founder Stephen Gutowski. How are we doing this week, Steve? I'm doing all right. A little bit tired after my trip out to Vegas, but uh, pretty good overall. How about you? 
Uh, same, a little tired, but uh, been a pretty busy week here at the for my other job uh, down at the Capitol. Uh, Colorado's legislative session is in full swing, so busy keeping an eye on things over there. But uh, I'm good; can't complain. Yeah, and we'll you'll have to keep an eye on the the gun bills that are going through there too. That's true. Yeah, there's some uh, interesting proposals being talked about, but nothing nothing that's really advanced so far just yet. No, yeah, no. Yeah. Um, what do we have in terms of news this week? Sure. Yeah. So uh, in the newsletter links, uh, one comes to us from the center square talking about the latest on Illinois assault weapon ban and the registry that's part of that law. So the deadline for folks that owned ba- uh, guns that were banned under that law to actually register them with the state was January 1st. Uh, we wrote about obviously that there was a pretty low compliance level uh, in the last month or so since that registration deadline took effect. There's been about 5000 more uh Registries, late registries, bringing the yeah, total illegal up to about registries, one, uh, really t- technically illegal. That's right. Since it's past the deadline, um, bringing the total up to about 1.5% of gun owners that have registered under the law. So still very low compliance numbers. And an interesting um, Illinois attorney general opinion was issued after this to say that basically the state doesn't have any enforcement authority to one, go after people that register late and two, go after people that just don't register at all. So kind of begs the question, you know, <laughs> what's the point of the, the, the law or at least the registration component if there's no, you yeah. know, so just interesting, uh, another instance of registry attempts that kind of are toothless. Yeah, typical how these things play out in real life, which is the law becomes mostly symbolic. Um, they don't actually try to go around and round up people who didn't comply. Uh, that's just not how these actually work out in real life most of the time, especially in the United States. And <clears throat> I mean, you read about this uh, at the time when the registration went into effect and there was that really low compliance rate, at least as far as we can tell, you know, there's not necessarily every gun owner in Illinois has one of these affected guns, but when you're at under 1% or I guess 1.5% of gun owners registering some guns, one of these guns, and they're very popular firearms that are affected by this. Uh, AR-15s, but also lots and lots of other guns. Uh, that gives you pretty good insight that not a lot of people are actually <laughs> doing what the state is requiring. But yeah, this, this is an interesting twist on it, where they're just coming out and saying they can't enforce the law anyway. Um, but and and from a Democratic AG too, right? It's not. You might, I wouldn't be shocked to see that from like a, a sheriff. You know, a lot of the sheriffs before this law went into was passed said they wouldn't enforce it. And that's not, that's very common. You see that in a lot of states, including Colorado with the magazine ban, a lot of, a lot of sheriffs there don't enforce that. And, uh, or even New York with the safe act, a lot of upstate sheriffs don't bother to enforce that law. And it's more interesting seeing it coming from a democratic attorney general who is in the administration that passed the law to begin with. But I mean, in, in real life, they don't have the resources to go out and try and arrest everybody who didn't comply with this law. And so the only what ends up happening usually is these get used as tack on charges. So if you end up in trouble with the law in some other way and they figure out that you have a banned uh, unregistered firearm, they'll add that to whatever other crime they already got you on. That's usually how these things go. Um, not that, not that there aren't examples of people getting prosecuted anyway, and not that that makes it much less uh, of a problem because, you know, everyone who has an unregistered gun has a crime hanging over their head in theory, but, but that's how it works out in practice. And I think it's important to keep track of all that and for people to understand it. Yeah. But it, like you said, it is interesting to see a, a, an attorney general come right out and say it. Um, yeah, it's. Speaking of attorneys general, uh, the the other link we're going to talk about today comes to us from uh, Cam Edwards, actually, who you guys just heard from on the show over at Bearing Arms, uh, about uh, a letter that was sent by every single Republican attorney general in the country uh, regarding the Lake City ammunition plant, which we previously covered because almost every Democratic AG wrote a letter to the Biden administration asking him to crack down on civilian sales of excess production from that, that ammunition plant. Um, so these Republicans are basically pushing back on that request, urging the Biden administration not to do so, saying that, you know, it's vital for national security that this be allowed to happen for reasons we previously covered in the piece. And I talked to Marco Oliva over at the uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation about why that is. 
Um, and an interesting component to that letter was they actually cited some of the reloads reporting because this plant has come under scrutiny several times. And it was actually a 2022 instance in which the plant was coming under fire and, and you did some reporting on it. Um, so the reload got cited as well. Yeah, the reload's been getting cited a lot. Our reporting's been getting cited a lot in these sorts of government letters or court cases. Um, federal judge opinions have been citing us uh, pretty frequently now. So it's, it's, it's good to see our work making uh, an impact out there. Uh, and getting noticed, but, uh, you know, that's the, and, and that, that kind of stuff has real, real world effects. I think, um, you know, writing about that story when it first, when the, there was first news that they were going to consider shutting down civilian, uh, it was basically mil, mil surp production at, uh, you know, military surplus production at this, this ammunition plant, the, you know, that's a, a lot of uh, Winchester ammunition comes from that plant. Uh, so if you see, you know, the Winchester white box stuff, I believe that comes from Lake City. So uh, it's a pretty significant part of the civilian market. And um, it also, the argument goes, at least from from the industry uh, and from these attorney generals, attorneys general, you, you're not supposed to say it, attorneys yeah. general. It's, it's, a funny, it's very odd, but that's, yeah. that's how you're supposed to say. But the, they're arguing that not only does it benefit civilians, but it benefits the military, too, because if you shut down that production, that means you're going to have to shut down parts of that production line and lay off workers. And then if there's some, uh, you know, issue where the military needs a lot of ammunition, you know, war, for instance, it's going to be much harder to ramp up production from that point because you've laid off people who would, and you've shut down machines that would otherwise be operating to uh, service the, the civilian market. And I mean, frankly, military surplus ammunition and, and firearms is something that's been part of American tradition for its entire existence. You know, like this is not some new thing, right? Uh, so what they want to do is, is really the new thing. Like they want to eliminate that. And, um, yeah, and really not even an American thing. There's a lot of countries that sell military surplus to their civilians. Um, and, and so it would be a pretty radical change if the Biden administration goes down this path. But obviously they've been open to doing all kinds of uh, different uh, things to restrict civilian uh, gun access. So wouldn't be surprised if they end up doing this, but they didn't do it the first time around. And. We'll have to see what they decide uh, this time, but it's good to see our reporting making a difference out there, being cited in these these sorts of uh, important situations by and oftentimes by either side as well. You know, it's not just Republicans citing our work, um, and that's you know we're just trying to get the facts of the situation out to people, and I'm glad that's having an impact. Certainly. Uh, and then some of the stories that we wrote about this week, there was a, a big federal appellate court ruling out of the First Circuit that essentially brought back Mexico's civil liability suit against essentially the largest gun makers in the country. Um, it brought it back to life. It was previously, we covered this, it was previously dismissed in the district court because that judge said that it was basically all of Mexico's claims were preempted by the Federal Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, which is the civil liability uh, shield for the federal gun industry um, in instances where their products are used by criminals, third parties. Um, well, the First Circuit actually said that uh, Mexico's claims can proceed because it they make a plausible case that uh, some of their claims fall under one of the PLCA's exception, uh, exceptions so that now it can go back to the district court level and see if maybe they can possibly succeed. So pretty big ruling with some pretty big implications. Yeah, certainly. This is uh, very similar to the Sandy Hook case where it, it's not likely that Mexico is going to succeed on the merits here because their claim is essentially that American gun companies advertising has incited Mexican criminals and cartel members to commit acts of violence uh, to seek out American guns to do so, um, which is something that I think would take a, a lot of specific evidence in court to actually uh, win on the merits, which I don't think they have because it's kind of a, it's a kind of a um, implausible claim. 
But that's not really the point of these sorts of cases, right? I mean, the, the goal here is not to actually win on the merits or to get, uh, you know, a court ruling in your favor on the merits. The goal is to file lawsuits that uh, tie up gun companies in court and maybe you can get some embarrassing documents in discovery potentially is, is one goal of this. I mean, or maybe if you're lucky, you can get a settlement like in the, the Sandy Hook case. Um, I mean, if you look at the Sandy Hook case, they, they talk a lot about this, wanting the internal documents to publish, which we really haven't seen much out of that uh, since they got all the documents that they did. And um, <clears throat> presumably there may not be the sort of emails or internal memos that they were looking for, hoping to, to find where, you know, essentially they're like, they're looking for gun company employees or executives to talk about how they want to sell guns to people who can't have them. And I don't think that probably exists in the internal documents they got, but that's just speculation on my part. Uh, I would think if they had those kind of documents, they would have been shared already. But <clears throat> regardless, that's kind of the end goal here. And, and it's very similar to what was going on that prompted the PLCAA in the first place, which was a lot of cities were suing gun companies <clears throat> over the claim that the vi violent crime inside of a city was the fault of gun companies. And again, the goals there were never really to get merits victories. They were just to try and get as far as you can in a case, try to keep it going for as long as you can and, and hope that a, a company might settle to get rid of the case or uh, just to burn up some of their resources defending it. So the PLCAA was passed to prevent those kinds of, of suits on that specific claim that, that uh, you know, a gun company is responsible for the criminal actions of a third party that they weren't directly, you know, working with or involved with in any way. Um, but there seems essentially the Sandy Hook case, as we wrote about at the time, now serves as a template for these sorts of attempts. And that's exactly what Mexico is using because it's the same thing in the Sandy Hook case. They used uh, advertising. They were claiming that gun ads had influenced the Sandy Hook shooter in some way. Um, they never, again, they didn't have any evidence that this actually happened, but that was enough for the courts, at least in Massachusetts, to say that you can proceed on this claim. This is one thing I think people need to get about these kinds of lawsuits. This ruling in Mex the Mexico case is similar to the Sandy Hook case, where it wasn't that the court said your argument is is correct or that where we agree with you or that you've proved this is the case. It's just that the argument is plausible, that this could be something that you can pursue even under the PLCAA. You're using, uh, what, like you mentioned, an exemption that exists to make a plausible claim. They're not, the court's not saying your claim is correct or that you've proved it. Uh, in fact, in both these cases, the, I mean, the Massachusetts Supreme Court in the Sandy Hook case uh, said that it's very unlikely, essentially, that they're going to be able to prove the merits claim, that they need a really high bar uh, of evidence to do that. Uh, but the case never got to that point. And uh, same thing here with Mexico. The court even cautions that you'd need, they'd have to actually prove these claims in court to win but they're allowing the case to move forward. And that's uh, what a lot of this fighting is about. Uh, and a lot of the concern in the gun industry is about the, just getting to this point is a win for uh, Mexico and the gun control advocates who've, who've backed them. Yeah. And it is, it, like you said, it's still early stages, but it is also kind of uh, noteworthy because it's an unprecedented suit in the sense that it's the first time that a, a foreign government is trying to advance these yeah. claims over the gun industry, um, which you've seen a very concerted effort, at least on the gun control side of things, to advance that argument that foreign countries are being harmed by uh, American products, um, which will sort of segue us into our, our final story that we're going to talk about that you've been talked that you reported on. Um, and that's the Biden administration's ongoing pause on 
granting new licenses to the Commerce Department for gun companies to export their firearms under the similar logic that that somehow sometimes gun industry products in the United States gun industry are facilitating you know crime or, or other misdeeds abroad. Um, and now we have a new letter from some Democratic lawmakers that seeking the Biden administration not only to extend that pause, but to sort of crack down on the practice altogether, if you want to talk about what your reporting found. Yeah. And in addition to that, we have some prominent Republicans who are pushing back in the opposite direction, right? Who, right. who think it's a, um, an attack on the Second Amendment, um, which is kind of an interesting claim, given that uh, these are firearms exports. And I think there's probably less protection for that that work um, in the Second Amendment than, you know, perhaps domestic sales or or but, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this works out in the courts if it does, if there is a case. Um, but, yeah, essentially, the Biden administration has paused exports of certain kinds of guns, at least. Um, you know, really, they seem to be trying to go after so-called assault weapons, you know, AR-15s and similar firearms with this regulation, but the export of them instead of internal sales. And uh, they pause that except for certain countries that are in what's called the Wassenaar Agreement, which is a trade, uh, gun, uh, an arms trade treaty that, in, and then also they've exempted like Israel and Ukraine in theory, but, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, every, every week, yeah. every time, <laughs> mm. I don't know how to, there's like no way to prevent it. I don't know. <clears throat> Once you talk long enough, you just, it, ha it happens <clears throat> anyway. Sorry about that. Yeah. So they paused all export licensing. So people are still operating under old licenses because they uh, are good for four years or up to a certain quantity or, or what have you. But during that time, they've exempted some of these other countries. Um, however, there, we published a leaked draft of what the Commerce Department wants to put in place permanently as new rules. And that would eliminate some of these exemptions, in particular for Ukraine and Israel which are two obviously global hotspots, very politically um, contentious at the moment uh, with, uh, you know, armed guns going there, whether as military aid or in this case for civilian sale, uh, because Ukraine and Israel have both loosened their, their strict gun laws in the wake of uh, the, the attacks that they've seen. And so... <clears throat> There are more people being able to actually buy American-made guns now than before. Uh, but at the same time, the administration seems poised to clamp down on that. Um, now, the Commerce Department has said that they're, this is not a final rule, that they haven't made any final decisions. The pause also, while they it says 90 days, which should have run out <clears throat> uh, already, they noted when I reached out to them that they actually wrote approximately 90 days. So I guess there's no clear end of when this pause is going to stop and they're going to announce whatever replacement they come up with, whether it's the draft that we leaked or some sort of revision of that. I would be surprised if it wasn't very close to the, the, the draft that we published. But, um, you know, and yeah, this has driven a lot of controversy in the gun industry, but of course there are supporters for it as well uh, in the Democratic Party. Although there was only four Democrats on that letter that you mentioned being sent to the Commerce Department, where they want the pause to be extended, and they want a bunch of new restrictions. Some of them included in this draft proposal, some of them not. Things like even uh, having commerce stop working with the industry, sort of uh, directly, like they don't want them to go to Shot Show anymore, which is the where I just was, um, and. You know, other they don't want them to. They want them to be very uh, strict as, as to what guns get exported to Israel in particular, as well. Um, and and yeah, they explicitly blame American gun companies for violence in other countries. Sometimes citing specific examples like the Thailand mass shooting that uh, a police officer carried out uh, a couple of years. I think it was last year or two years ago. I think it was 2022. And uh, you know, saying that he used an American-made gun. 
Of course, he was a police officer at the time, uh, or that's why he was able to buy guns as far as my understanding of that incident. But they also sort of point to just general increase in violence as well. So it's not just um, specific incidents that they're noting for why American exports of firearms need to be restricted further. But, uh, you know, I actually talked to an exporter at SHOT Show. Did you, were you able to read that piece? I was going to say, yeah, I saw you had a, you had a member's piece. Members can read it right now, obviously, uh, detailing. Basically, he, he kind of talked to you about uh, the practical implications of what the Commerce Department was pursuing. And it was very interesting, the, the fact that he thought it would have a devastating impact on his ability to operate. Yeah, I mean, he he seems to think that it would basically put him out of business or at least come close to doing that. He said, right. Uh, and, and yeah, I thought it was important to actually talk to somebody directly affected by the bank because it can be very dry and academic in some sense. I mean, we're talking about export controls and stuff, but uh, the reality is it has a big impact on <clears throat> a lot of gun industry members. So, uh, you know, obviously exporters like... Uh, like Jordan Young, who's uh, CEO of Global Defense, that that's the interview I did and was a member's piece on that. Uh, but also a lot of the sort of mid to small size manufacturers, gun manufacturers, you know, he works with 20 brands, uh, people like Aero Precision and uh, Volquestrian and Zev, you know, some, some relatively well-known, but not huge brands. Um, and, and, you know, he was arguing that that's, those are the kind of companies that are going to have a big problem if this uh if this proposal becomes law because you know a lot more of their businesses rely on exports uh you know i spoke to one manufacturer that he works with and and he said you know he he manufactures all sorts of things i think mainly furniture uh but he also does firearms and it's uh you know it makes up like 20 30 percent of his business and they're mostly for export um and you know the if the if they can't get export licenses, they can't make sales. Like their businesses are going to basically shrink or go away altogether. I mean, uh, Young's business is fifty percent exports, fifty percent imports. He thinks they're going to move to imports next, which would I mean, there's no particular reason why they wouldn't uh, under the same concept that they're talking about. But uh, he, he called the proposal unworkable, especially the part where they are trying to require exporters to get uh, end users identification. So whoever is the individual person buying the gun in another country, uh, you, the exporter would have to obtain copies of their passport or something similar in order to sell them a gun. And that would radically change how things work right now. Cause basically the way it works is you get a license to export to an it, to somebody in that country who's an importer and they have to be licensed in their country and follow the laws of the country that they're in and, and, and handle everything um, on that end. Uh, and now it would be on, on the responsibility of exporters to do that, to, to really kind of create and manage a gun registry for foreign countries um, for people who buy the American imports, which is pretty, a pretty wild concept, honestly. <laughs> Um, uh, it's something we don't even do here in the United States. You know, if you sell a, if you sell a gun in the United States, you aren't required to collect somebody's, uh, personal information. Uh, that's something the dealers do, not the gun export, not the gun company or the wholesaler. So, uh, he, he said it would be unworkable and it was just basically would put him out of business. Um, so that, that kind of gets to the core of, of the issue, but he had a lot of, really interesting and insightful stuff to say about how this has actually worked in practice. Because the pause started 90 days ago, but he said they actually stopped issuing export licenses or at least drastically slowed down how many they were issuing well before then, back to July. And so it's really been more like six months that this has been going on. He's only gotten four export licenses approved in that time span when he used to get five per month. So it's been a uh, really significant drop off in his ability to, to export guns. Um, and, and, and also kind of, you know, he, I think he, he noted this is sort of 
the opposite of what the Commerce Department is supposed to be doing, like what their mission is, you know, they're supposed to promote American manufactured products abroad, uh, not restrict them. But uh, he believes, uh, yeah, and I think this is fair to infer that this is more of a political move. Um, and, you know, if you read the letter from Senator Warren and Durbin, they explicitly say that the Biden administration should be restricting these exports because of its uh, desire for gun control generally. So there's, I'm sure will be more to come on that and we'll keep following it. But I, I thought it was uh, important to talk to somebody who's directly affected by it because it could be kind of um, difficult to wrap your head around what's going on and how it actually affects people because it's not necessarily affecting the guns that uh, gun stores here in America or even large gun companies because they either can find ways around this by manufacturing in other countries and exporting from there to, to avoid some of these restrictions um, or they they don't rely a lot on exports generally anyway so it's more the smaller companies and exporters that are being hit by this and and you know it's always important to understand where they're coming from and of course we also in, include the perspective of senator warren and, and durbin in there for why they think this is valuable. they they claim you know it'll help prevent terrorism and and violence overseas so uh you know people can read that and decide for themselves of course, but uh, we will we will certainly stay on top of it. Um, what uh, by the way, what do you what do you got going on this weekend? Anything fun? Uh, football mostly. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Maybe yeah. I'll try to go to the range. It's been a little while since I've I've actually had a chance to go. It's been pretty busy over here on my end, so it actually would be a little mm -hmm. nice to get out and do a range trip. So we'll see if I can squeeze that in. But other than that, probably just watching some playoff football. Um, how was uh how was your week at Shot Show? It was good. You know, it was um, tiring, of course, a lot of walking and roaming around. Uh, I didn't get to do range day this year, which is unfortunate, but uh, I did get to see a lot of the new guns. I think one of the ones that really interests me is uh, that Daniel Defense H9. So people might remember the Hudson H9 from a couple of years back, got a lot of sort of hype, um, kind of a hybrid 1911 striker fired gun with a really low bore axis and they put the recoil spring below, you know, below the, the top of the trigger guard. So you can get a super low bore axis and uh, interesting gun. I remember shooting that one at shot a couple of years ago and thinking it was, it was certainly unique. I wasn't blown away by it. Like I was with the Lago alien or something like that. Cause the Lago alien is a $5,000 gun. So, uh, you know, it's not necessarily com comparable, but Daniel Defense, the Hudson went bankrupt and Daniel Defense bought their patents, I guess, and they reworked the whole gun. And so that's that was kind of the talk of the town, I thought, at SHOT Show. That was what a lot of people have focused on that particular gun. And I didn't get to shoot it, but I did get to handle it at their booth. And um, it's it's really cool. It's really unique design. I like it. Uh, I will say that the trigger felt really heavy. So I don't it like it's short travel, like a 1911 trigger, but it just felt a lot heavier than a, than a 1911 trigger does. Um, so, or mo you know, obviously there's different 1911 triggers out there, but you, I think you get what I'm, what I'm saying. So, uh, you know, that was probably the most interesting new gun that I saw. Um, and then there's all kinds of, you know, wacky stuff. There was a flamethrower attachment for an AR, which I imagine will you know, there's always something at SHOT Show that you see it and I think, well, if, if this ever gets noticed by uh, a gun control group or media person, it's probably going to be a big story, even if it shouldn't necessarily be. This was this is what happened with, uh, if you remember, the, the little fake pseudo, uh, what do you want to call it? So, what did they call it? The JR-15? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember that gun? That's right. It's not an actual AR-15, but it it's a 22 modeled to look like an AR-15, which is also not even a new thing when it came out. That Smith and Wesson had a right. 22 rifle that is modeled to look like an AR-15. Neither one of these things is actually they don't work with AR-15 components. They just look like AR-15s on the outside cosmetically. Um, 
but the big difference was that the JR15 was uh, was sold using basically troll advertising. Like the goal was clearly to upset um, gun control advocates and Democratic politicians. And it worked because they had like, it's a mini AR-15, which is controversial enough uh, for uh, gun control advocates. And then it also had branding that was like skull and crossbones with a pacifier. So like it was clearly designed to garner that kind of reaction. And it did get that. In fact, that's what yeah. led to the whole California uh, you know, youth shooting sports ban, essentially, who, like what effectively created that by their poorly drafted legislation in response to this single gun that's never actually been used in any sort of crime and isn't, isn't even a unique uh, concept and has been around for that Smith & Wesson version by a much larger company had been around for years and years before this became a controversy. But anyway, I saw the fire, the flamethrower that you can strap onto the bottom of an AR. And uh, that makes me think that's going to be the next thing. Reminiscent of the uh, the infamous chainsaw bayonet that, that yes. ran around. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's very chainsaw bayonet feeling. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be noticed by anyone to the point where it's going to create a big outrage and uh, there was already an outrage cycle over flamethrower stuff when Elon Musk did the right. uh, his yeah. fake flamethrower thing, which was I don't know if people don't remember this. It's it's one of these things where it's again stuff that's been around, not just flamethrowers, but all Elon Elon Musk's flamethrower was flamethrower. It was a uh, it was a roofing torch, so they use in, in roofing to lay down you know a certain kind of roofing tile you need heat and so they use these like acetylene torches or i don't i don't know what it's probably not acetylene but they use a torch to put heat to the ground to the roof when they're doing this and it's a common tool that's available everywhere and all elon musk did was take that tool and put it a put it inside of a uh i believe it was an airsoft gun shell and that's literally all that was so like <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this one starts some sort of outrage in in the USA Today chainsaw bayonet <laughs> thing. Yeah. But we'll have to see. Um, yeah, and I got to go to the range too and, and uh, sight in my, my red dot for my X macro. And I also ended up, what I ended up doing was getting extent... Um, extensions for my p365 10 round magazine that are like 3d printed you get them off ebay for a couple bucks and uh so that the 10 round magazine will fit into the x macro for when i carry in dc it's still going to be a pain because i'll have to leave the 17 round magazines at home and swap them out with the 10 rooms whenever i'm going to dc to carry but at least i have the option now and i that's how i'm approaching it uh, you can do it the other way too if you you can get the 17 round magazines and put a little um, insert in, the, in the, that blocks it from holding more than 10 rounds. Um, but I went the other way because I already have a 365 10 round magazine. So I don't know. we'll see what, what happens. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I'm that's my stopgap for now. I could carry a whole nother gun. The whole thing is just annoying, but it is what it is. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, well, I'll, I'll keep you guys updated on how that all goes uh, and how the how that little extension block thing works. It's literally just a piece of plastic that you slide on as your the end cap for your magazine. And it's just a long piece of plastic that sticks out the bottom. Um, but it doesn't increase the round capacity. It just makes it so that it'll fit into the the macro. But uh yeah, I haven't been shooting in a little while either. I, so I guess we both have to head to the range and get some practice in. That's right. Go sharpen up our skills. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all we've got for this week. Um, if you like what we do here at The Reload, you can head over to thereload.com and either sign up for our free newsletter, which comes once a week on Fridays. doesn't flood your inbox. 
uh, but does give you access to sober, serious firearms reporting and analysis uh, every week. Keeps you up to date with what's going on. Of course, if you want to go deeper and have a better understanding of it all, you can buy a membership and that'll give you access to hundreds of pieces of analysis and exclusive stories like the one we mentioned earlier with the gun exporter at SHOT Show. Um, and that also is how we are able to continue to do our work is through the support of our members. So uh, we really value that. And of course, you'll also get early access to this podcast, as well as the opportunity to appear on the show in a member segment. Just reply to your Sunday newsletter, which is another perk of being a member that you receive an extra newsletter with uh, an analysis every Sunday. And um, yeah, I think it's I think it's good value. You should you should check it out. <laughs> um, but if you're not ready to make that purchase, you can also help us by rating and sharing this podcast with anyone you think might be interested in it. That, of course, helps us as well to get the word out. But uh, that's all we've got for you this week. We will be back again real soon.